So it is how to retain empty knowledge before it walks out the door. Um, so that is the title, um, and uh, let's uh, look at that. So first, what is knowledge retention? So different uh, definitions, of course, capturing knowledge in the organization, so it can be used later. This is a really practical one, nor formal one, the collective, collective ability to store and retrieve knowledge and information. The bottom line is what you want. You want to capture the knowledge and experience that live in your organization and create your organizational memory. That is what it's all about. So uh, you want to sort of make sure that you track and trace everything uh, and then store that and make it available to people when they need it. So that is the, what knowledge retention is. And if you look at it, um, there are very different types of knowledge around and also uh, you can, if you will surf uh, the web, you will find a lot of different definitions. I like this one. It's an old one from Walsh and Unsen, and they did a research and they came up with like five categories of knowledge that you need to uh, uh, address. So the first one is individual. That's the knowledge that everybody brings to the table. So the second one is about structures. That is really about how you organize things in your company, how people relate to each other, how your social structures and company structures are. And that sort of defines uh, the context in which people can actually uh, gain knowledge, but also share knowledge. Uh, cultural is, of course, an important aspect, and that goes both for the company culture, but also local cultures, uh, which has an, uh, uh, a huge impact on, on, on the knowledge and the knowledge retention. So all that kind of information, so how you do things basically in your company is really defined by cultural. Then we have transformations, and that is everything in processes. So all the formal process you have in your company, all the flows that there are there, the funnels, uh, the, how information flows and how customers flow through your company, all those kind of uh, uh, knowledge uh, is, is connected to what they call transformations. And finally, you have external activity things where you as a company interact with other companies and those kind of information that can be customers, that can be partners, uh, that can be uh, whatever kind of organizations. And those kind of external activities also generate a lot of information and knowledge. So there are five categories of knowledge that we're talking about. And if you look at how knowledge is sort of divided, it's a very simple overview here. Uh, it's from Paul Scott, but it's not that complicated. So you have knowledge, which is on the bottom in the, the deep orange that everybody in your organization knows and shares. So that's the easy one. Then you have knowledge that is available and accessible for everybody, but it is like not top of mind, but people can access that. And then you have individual and collective knowledge that is not accessible for the, for the company. So there is knowledge, but uh, it's just sort of hidden in people's minds or maybe in a drawer or, or a server. And then you have other knowledge in the environment of the company. So that is a one step further away. And then you go into the big world. And of course, the key thing is to get as much uh, as the content, as the knowledge that you have, uh, in, either in the, the well in the first two of these so knowledge shared by all members of the organization and if people can't memorize it if it's not always up to date they need to be able to access it and for that you need first need to store it and retrieve it so that is uh, where knowledge is and, and basically uh, the the darker the orange becomes the, the it more interesting the knowledge becomes because it becomes available immediately uh, when people are working so Knowledge retention uh, is driven uh, by a couple of things, but one of the big things is that people will actually leave your organization most of the time, sooner or later. Um, so in general, we see a trend that people are working shorter for one thing or organization than they used to. So if you look back like 50 years, people would have like a few employers during the lifetime, maybe even one. Uh, if I look at myself, so Easy Generator, although I'm there already for 12 years, it's like my eighth uh, employer. So, and you see that happening more and more, but that pace also picking up. I recently read a study that uh, uh, in their first 10 years, a graduate in the States, uh, on average, stays shorter than one year in a job. So that is really, 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 pretty fast. But whenever they leave, they take away knowledge and experience they build up. And of course, the longer they stay in your company, the more knowledge and experience there is there. 
to, to, lead, to lose. But that is not the only reason that people are just working shorter for your organization. It's also people retiring. And again, I am an example. So I'm, I just turned 60, so I'm from Generation X. And Generation X is uh, the generation that will leave the workforce between now and 10 years from now. So with that, they will take a huge part of the, the knowledge and experience that they have with them. So you need to capture that before it leaves your company. Then uh, on the bottom right, the great resignation, something we experienced during COVID. So uh, during COVID, a lot of people had to work from home. So they had literally more distance to their job. And we're looking at the job, is this uh, the, the thing that I want to do for the rest of my life? And a surprisingly large amount of people answered that question with no. And uh, we see uh, percentages of uh, people, of companies losing like 30, 40, 50, even 60% of their staff within a year. And that was really triggered by COVID, but it's something that's still going on. So there is a great mobility right now in, in the workforce, uh, and as, but it, it really got a boost with the whole COVID thing. And uh, well, uh, you hear more and more about looming recessions and things getting tougher from an economic perspective with the war in Ukraine going on, the inflation that comes out of that, uh, the rising costs. So um, budget cuts are probably inevitable for a lot of companies. And with budget cuts, it also means that you probably need to say farewell to, to employees. So then uh, you sort of push them out, but still you lose their experience and you lose their knowledge. So these are five reasons or four reasons why you could lose uh, employees and all reasons why it's really important to capture their knowledge uh, before it is too late. And uh, just to dive in all of them, just one by one. So as I said, people are working shorter for one organization and, uh, and it's happening all the time. And uh, so to retain knowledge, so the first thing probably you have to do is try to retain your employees. Uh, so, and, and it is something that a lot of organizations put a lot of effort in, in facilitating people uh, after COVID also, uh, things are way more flexible, working from home. Uh, you even have uh, uh, people who are now sort of traveling the world and working from wherever they are at that moment. Um, so there are the digital nomads, they're called. So companies really try to facilitate that uh, with all their might, but still they will see people leaving. And uh, we have it sometimes at DC Generator. Sometimes it happens at DC Generator, of course, uh, as well. And um, sometimes you lose people that you really don't want to lose. I remember we, we lost one of our sales guys uh, not that long ago uh, because he had a dream. He worked for a couple of years really hard and was really successful in our company. And he said, okay, I want to take a sabbatical and uh, he wants to go to the Antarctic. And you can't compete with that as an organization. So people will be leaving your organizations. And I already mentioned a couple of other reasons there. So they're just working shorter for you. They're more mobile. So make sure that before they leave, you need to catch up, but also try as hard as you can, of course, to keep them in. That is the best knowledge retention that you can do. So a couple of numbers here. So employee turnover is averaging 60% in 2021 in the United States. Um, so the millennium uh, generation is now being dubbed a glass door generation. So, um, and really important because, well, I was already talking about the generation X leaving, but the other generation follow. So, you have to remember that by 2030, and that is just eight years from now, a bit less even, 75% of the workforce will be from the millennial generation. So their mindset and their uh, approach to work and how they view work will be dominating at that time. So you need to prepare for that. And eight years is not a long time. So, and 75% of millennials believe job hopping can be good for their careers. As I said, we see the 60% turnover employees. We, we see companies losing significant amounts of, of people. And that is triggered for a large thing by, by things like this. And those percent, percentages are a bit lower if you look at different uh, uh, age categories. So between 35 and, and 54 is 59%. Above 55 is 51%, but still then, People above 55, more than 50% of them believe that job hopping is good for their career. So it means you have to fight for, to keep your people in and you have to fight to keep your knowledge in. People retiring. So 
um, between now and uh, 15 years, 85% of the current workforce will retire. That is more than half. You have the baby boomers who are currently in the process of retiring or are already retired, which is like uh, 52%. Generation X that I mentioned between 1965 and 1980, uh, which is 33%. And a large part of that group will uh, uh, retire over the next years. And then you have the millennials and Generation Z uh, flowing up on that. Um, but it means that you will lose so much uh, of the knowledge that you have. And this is something that is just happening. What we, what you see happening is that people after they retire sometimes work like still part-time because retirement is not like a uh, really uh, as, as, as clear cut as it was uh, in the past, but still it will be very hard to retain that knowledge. So it's something you have to work on and you need to capture. So, as I mentioned, budget cuts. So recession is looming, uh, triggered by the war, but also before the war, there were some signs that things were slowing down significantly. We had, of course, uh, after the, the, the financial crisis, the banking crisis, a period of growth of like uh, eight, nine years uh, constantly. It differs a bit from country to country. And um, yeah, the economy, economy is slowing down, um, uh, triggered uh, even more by the war, the rise of the, the the, the prices of energy, especially triggered by the boycotts of, uh, of Russia and the other way that Russia is not delivering energy anymore or uh, really, really unclear situation. Uh, but it will lead inevitably to budget cuts and it will lead to losing people. And uh, it's also really important that um, if you have to make budget cuts and you have to save farewell to people, then very often, uh, the uh, the idea is that you want to sort of spare the most experienced people because they are the most worthwhile. But what, keep in mind that people like me are not there in a couple of years anymore. We are retired. So probably it's better to, to make sure that you capture that information from those people and maybe bet your money on the younger generation. So the great resignation also should be some extra details. So uh, a record number of people left their jobs since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's still going on, although the pandemic isn't, isn't hurting us as much as it was. So, so it's really different than a year ago. I think we were in a lockdown a year ago in the Netherlands. But what we see also for the last years is that we have really low unemployment rates and really high vacancy rates, which is a bit strange with a looming recession, but uh, it's still really hard to find people. There are way more people uh, uh, way more uh, openings for, for jobs than there are actually people that are looking for a job, which is a, quite a unique situation. Uh, it also sort of draws people out. It makes it really easy if they are not completely happy in your company or they think they can make an extra buck next door or they can make an extra step in the career next door, probably they uh, are inclined to go because they will be able to find a job very easy. Not sure how that will develop with uh, the the recession going on. So I heard here in the Netherlands, the first uh, uh, layoffs already announced. So for example, Philips, which is one of the main companies in the Netherlands, announced that they will uh, ha they have to let go like 4,000 people. Uh, so that is something we haven't heard for years. So this will probably become a bit more normal, but still it's really, really hard to find the right people for the right jobs and, and maintain the level of quality. And it's even harder to keep people in because there is like a pull factor going on from outside. I think that everybody at Easy Generator probably uh, will receive all kind of uh, uh, emails and uh, from uh, headhunters or other companies offers. So that is really, really normal nowadays. And that happens. And sometimes uh, an offer like that can be really attractive. So, but also remember that on average, replacing an employee will cost you 33% of their yearly salary. So let's say that an employee will cost you 100,000, then it's 33,000 K that you will lose, that you will actually lose uh, to, to sort of replace uh, that employee. So that's also something you need to take into account. And that also means that investing in keeping the people in and keeping the knowledge in that way is like uh, your number one priority. So that is the situation. So it's clear what knowledge retention is. Uh, it's clear why it's important, why people are leaving your company and why you need to make sure that you retain that. And if you look at this, then uh, this part here, the white part, that is basically where your sort of your knowledge is safe, but everything on top of that, it isn't. 
And basically what you need to do, you need to bring that down. And probably don't want to get all the information into people's heads, but you want to collect that. So, and especially from those two rings uh, directly outside your company. So company that is uh, from your company, but is not accessible to the company. That is one thing. So it's uh, something that uh, that is your first goal. And second, information around your company that lives there. You want to bring that in and, and make it uh, and, and, and keep it for safe keeping and, uh, and, and retrieval. So with that, the question is, how do you do that? And that is something that uh, we uh, at Easy Generator uh, learned a lot about. So um, one thing that I really uh, uh, like is, is this quote from Lewis Platt, and sort of uh, it's some, something that gives direction to us uh, at Easy Generator. And it, it is like, if HP knew what HP knows, we'd be three times more productive. And if you think about it, it's so powerful because what he says basically if somebody in your organization has a problem probably somebody else has the solution to the problem and if somebody in your organization has a question probably somebody else in your organization has the answer so the key thing is that that information that knowledge is stored inside the employees hats and with that you can't access it you can't find it you can't retrieve it so you would be way more productive if all that information would be available. And that is sort of the holy grail for an easy generator to allow people to capture their knowledge, to build up that body of knowledge and make it available to other people. So um, also taking one step back, uh, you see that there are different kinds of uh, types of content. Um, so you have like really specific information that is around for a long time. So uh, those, that, that kind of information usually has, is documented pretty well. So it would be interesting what, uh, what we did at this generator sort of went through this, this quadrant and look at where uh, are we strong, where are we weak? And uh, this one uh, came out a bit uh, more uh, better than the rest. Uh, a specific and perishable, that is really a, a risky one because uh, it is really specific to your organization and it only has a short shelf life. So it, it changes a lot. And uh, examples of that are, for example, uh, recently I spoke to uh, uh, one of our customers, uh, Canadian Mint, and basically they said, well, we're the only uh, company that, that is responsible for creating money uh, in Canada. So we're the only ones, people who work here are the only ones who actually know how it's being done. But those kind of organizations also change a lot uh, with all the things that are going on. So what you see is the information they have is really specific. It's not available outside the company at all. So it is what the, everything what, what is known about the company lives inside the company, but also whenever it changes, uh, you need to track that as well. So just tracking it is not, uh, uh, and storing it is not sufficient. You need to make sure that you also follow up and make sure that it keeps up to date. On the bottom left, we have generic and durable. So that is a sort of uh, information that is really uh, 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 available to, uh, to really common knowledge and uh, that has a last long shelf life and that makes it uh, really easy. It's also not specific to your organization, but to many. So it's also something you can get from the outside. And on the right side, you have the, the specific to many or so uh, generic and perishable. But that is what is not that interesting for you. So what you see is that um, the things that are specific for your company, so the top of this quadrant, are the most important one to focus on and that uh, the perishable ones are the ones that are toughest to capture. And the more generic it becomes, uh, the more important it, it becomes to, to, to uh, track. So how to solve this problem? And it is something that we sort of stumbled on by accident with CG Generator because we started in a different place. We started in the world of e-learning development. And if you look at the world of e-learning development, something that I have been working in for a long time, uh, you see a process that is uh, how that content is created. So on the screen, you see the LMD, which stands for Learning and Development Department. Uh, so that department is responsible for developing learning material, courses, training, things like that. And uh, their, their uh, educational specialists are called instructor designers. So those are people with a, a specific knowledge about e-learning, online learning. So usually they are the ones who have to create the content. The problem that you have 
though, is that uh, it is the supplementary expert, the employee, uh, who has the knowledge. The knowledge is in the business, and most courses are, of course, actually about that content that's specific to your organization. So you need to get that information from the business side. So the instruction designer needs to interview those SMEs, separate experts, those employees to get that information, put it in a course, go back to them to see if it's still correct. Uh, he has to solve conflicting input that he gets. And that process of going back and forth between the instruction designers and the supplementary experts, that is really time consuming. And with that, e-learning development also becomes really expensive. So um, it's safe to say that uh, the development of e-learning is really, really slow because of it, and it is really expensive. But that is not even the biggest problem. The biggest problem is that when uh, the course is ready, it's being published into a learning management system, an LMS. And that is the environment where the learner can look, up for, the, uh, look for the course and, and take it. And most instruction designers consider their job done. And that is also because they are not connected to the business. So they are not aware that the, the process they, they have described in their course are actually changing all the time. And sometimes a course is even outdated when it's being published. But for certain, if you don't keep it up to date, it will be outdated in a matter of weeks or maybe months. So the problem is the instruction designer is responsible for the creation of, uh, uh, for the maintenance of the learning. But uh, uh, the knowledge is on the business side, so there is a disconnect there, there. And because of that, the instruction designer can't keep the content up to date. So what we came up with at TC Generator is a very simple solution. So you just need to leave the knowledge where it is. So we came up with the idea of employee generated learning, where not the instruction designer, but a system expert is responsible for the creation of the content. And we started out with uh, 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 helping them to create uh, e-learning courses. So we created a very simple e-learning authoring tool that basically anyone can work with and they can put their knowledge in there in the form of a course or a training. And then it will be published and uh, go to the learner. The instruction designer is still there, but not uh, responsible for those courses. So they can initiate it, they can coach, they can guide, they can help design, they can co-author, they can do whatever they want, except for taking over the responsibility for the creation and maintenance, because that needs to be in the business. That's the only way to guarantee that the content that you create is actually alive. So that is what we did at DC Generator. And with that, people started creating courses. And then we also added other information, so I think that we call micro learning. So you can think about how to's, best practices, frequently asked questions, checklists, very simple one page document that can actually capture a piece of knowledge and that you also can use while you're working. So it's really more performance support content than learning content. And that is really interesting because what's happening now is that uh, a body of knowledge becomes to, to uh, appear from that. It's not only learning material, but also a lot of things, actionable content in the form of micro learning that people can use while they're working to help them solve problems or to tell them how to do certain things. So that is something that is happening over time uh, with Easy Generator. At the same time, we see a couple of trends appearing in the world of learning that are also affecting uh, generic uh, 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 content creation in the company. So the first trend that we see is that things are moving from formal to informal learning. So Jay Cross, the guy on the screen, is like my ultimate e-learning hero. He was the guy, by the way, who coined the word e-learning uh, in the 90s for the first time, but is also the one who moved away. So with his book, Informal Learning, he said, um, he sort of dug up an old theory, which is called the 70-20-10 principle, which is on the bottom right. And that says that 70% of what you know is uh, you learn by experimental learning, by doing. 20% is social learning, learning from others. And 10% is formal learning. And you have to understand that formal learning is everything you learn from kindergarten to university, all face-to-face -face training, all e-learning courses are part of formal learning. And that was what e-learning was focusing on with a top-down approach in instruction design and creating that. And uh, with his book on informal learning, he really opened up the minds of a lot of people in the learning that we need to do more. But even with social learning and experimental learning, which is both are called together informal learning, it's really hard to sort of write that down top-down. So it doesn't work 
to do that from a central point. You need to facilitate the people who are actually doing that learning, who are experimenting that learning, to capture that learning and share that with others. So also from here, from the trend from form to informer, there's a big push towards more employee generated learning. The second trend is that things are moving from knowledge to skills. So on the screen is Kathy Moore, and she has a, a theory she calls action mapping. And there's a lot more to it, but one of the key elements of action mapping is that she says that it is not about knowing things in, if you are learning in a corporate environment, it's about being able to do things. So it is about a change of behavior. So either you need to learn new behavior or you need to change existing behavior. But if that doesn't happen, you don't have learning that adds value to your business. And with that, it's not about knowing things, it's about being able to do things. So it's not about knowledge, it's about skills. And that is a, a second trend that we see more and more because you can find information pretty easily at, the, at your fingertips. So, so a lot of things you can just uh, Google or find somewhere else, but then you need to have the knowledge or sorry, you have to have the skills to be able to apply that knowledge and put it into, uh, into action. So with the action mapping process, uh, Kathy Moore told us that skills are the focus point and knowledge becomes less important. So also a knowledge heavy uh, 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 course is not uh, uh, really effective. And this is also something to take into account if we are capturing uh, uh, information and experience from the business. You have to go beyond the fact that it's just fact A or fact B there also needs to be information there. And that's why the micro learning part is so important to also start capturing that. How do you do that? How is the process? How do you apply that? You need to know that. And that also needs to be stored. Best practices, things like that, how to guides are extremely important. And then finally, we come to Con and Bob who came up with what they call the five moments of, um, uh, of need. So it's also uh, the applied synergies of their company who came up with it. And what they did is really simple, but pretty brilliant. So there are three phases in learning. And they found that if you are completely new to something or when you are, when there's a lot of extra information, uh, it is fine to go into a training approach. So you have to transfer a lot of information and that is the, the black line going up. That is the, the learning curve. So you have to transfer a lot of information in a really short time. Training, a formal learning approach with face-to-face -face training, classroom training, e-learning courses, that is a really good option there. But then you move to the transfer phase. So after you have been trained initially, then you become, uh, uh, you are on your way to becoming competent, but you see the black line going down, which is the forgetting curve. So basically by working on the job, by repeating things, by learning, doing things over and over again, you really become competent. So you need some time to competency there. And there's a transfer phase. And finally, when you are competent, you are in the sustained phase where you need to maintain your knowledge. But even in those two phases, you still have three moments of learning need. So when something changes, you need to be able uh, uh, to, to find out how to deal with that change. If you have a problem, you need to find out how you can solve that. And we have forgotten about something, you need to be able to retrieve to, to find it back. And you need to be able to apply those three things. So with these five moments of needs, um, what they say is really interesting because only the first two are learning content. And the other three, again, are performance support content, content that you can use while you're working. Because if I encounter a problem, I do not want to stop working, go to a classroom or a learning management system to take a training. No, I just want to Google it and find the answer. The challenge that you have with that Googling is that a lot of that information on how to solve that problem will be company specific, uh, like I showed you in the previous uh, quadrant. So, and with that, you need to store it first. So you need to create sort of like your own corporate Google in order for people to find that information. And that again is that knowledge base uh, that you can build up as knowledge retention. And then the final trend is that things are moving from top down to bottom up. And that is really the, the, the story of Easy Generator. We're actually writing a book on this as we speak. So if you look at the society, you see so many things moving in this direction. I just put in one example from uh, the, the television network, but you could also do that for the world of traveling or, or, or uh, 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 hotels or uh, music or whatever. You see the similar uh, thing happening 
all over the place. So, but if we focus on the world of television, then in the old days, you had what I call the broadcaster. So the broadcasting organization, the television network. So in America, Fox, CBS, NBC, Discovery Channel. So every country has their own, but the organizations that, that program the TV for you. And that program, they determine what you have to watch and when you have to watch it. So you can't change the TV. So the news is at eight, the soap is at 8.20, and uh, there's a movie at uh, nine. And if you want something else, bad luck, you can have a choice to maybe switch channels, and maybe there's something better there, uh, or you can switch it off. But that's the choice that you have. So, and then we, of course, got into the era of the, what I call the streamer. So the Netflix-like organization. So before that, by the way, we first got, of course, the video stores uh, with uh, the blockbuster chains and things like that. We got TiVo, which was a programmable video recorder that could actually pre-record a whole series for you. So you could watch it whenever you wanted. And the key thing of those things is it gives more power to the viewer when and what they want to watch. And that is also what Netflix and all the other streaming organizations like uh, HBO Max and Disney Plus is all about. They have pretty much the same content as those television uh, networks. So they have series, they have movies and things like that. The difference is it's not pushed to you and it's not pre-programmed. It's just there waiting for you to go in into your Netflix or Disney Plus and find it and, 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 and watch it whenever you want and uh, also what you want and even on which device you want. So with that, you see that things are moving more bottom up because it's the viewer who's now uh, in charge of uh, determining what he wants to view and when he wants to view it. And then you go one step further and then you come into the, uh, the category of the creators. So then we talk about the YouTubes of this world uh, and the TikToks of this world. So they allow people to create content. So basically what you see happening is that the viewer become the creator of the content. So somebody can create his own YouTube videos and other people can watch that. But that same person can also be the viewer of other videos. So both with YouTube and TikTok, we now have channels where people can create their own content. So that's even more democratized than uh, with streaming because then you still have to consume information from somebody else. You're not able to create that content yourself. So we go from broadcasters to streamers to creators. Things are moving from top down to bottom up. And as I said, you can uh, apply that to many, many uh, parts of our, uh, uh, of our economy and our uh, society. And one of them is learning. So if I create the same image for learning, you will get a view like this. You have the broadcasters and in the world of learning, those are the learning management systems. So organizations, uh, solutions like Cornerstone, Docebo, Subsuccess Factors, they are learning management systems where the L&D department can actually put in courses and push that course towards the learner. So it is mandatory training, they have to do that, it will be tracked and traced, it's all top down. It's very similar to how the broadcasting organization works. So if I am new at an organization, I log into ALMS, I just see eight courses that I have to take and when I pass those eight courses, I'm onboarded. So it is really top down like with the TV. So I, con I consider uh, the big LMSs in, the, in our world uh, being the broadcasters of our world. But then we also move to the streamers. So learning experience platforms are really like uh, tools like Netflix and, uh, and, and HBO Max. So they have the same content as the LMSs. Sometimes in a, sm a sm smaller form, but in principle, the content is very much the same. The thing is, the content is not pushed to the learner. The content is there waiting for the learner. Whenever they have a learning need, they can go into that system and find it. So the difference between uh, uh, an, uh, an LXP and learning experience platform and a Netflix-like solution is really small. The content is different, but the approach is exactly the same. So as we saw with the broadcasting organization, you have broadcasters and streamers. And you also have the creators in, uh, in our world of learning. And in fact, the same two tools, YouTube and TikTok, are the, the largest educational platforms at the moment. So you, uh, I, I, for example, when I moved into the house that I'm now living in a few years ago, I wanted to, buy, uh, uh, to build a greenhouse from wood and glass with my own design. And I didn't know anything about that. So. YouTube taught me how to do that. And there's now already three years of beautiful greenhouse in my garden. Uh, TikTok is no different. TikTok is investing millions, and some people say even billions, in educational solutions. So a lot of learning content is on YouTube and TikTok. So they are becoming 
the more significant uh, learning uh, channels. And the thing is, the same happens as where the viewer becomes a creator. In this case, the learner becomes the teacher because I can learn from a YouTube video, but I can also create a YouTube video and share my knowledge and my information. And Easy Generator is like that, but then for a corporate environment. So it allows people to capture information, which can be a course, which can be a micro learning. Uh, by the end of the year, we even have video uh, uh, options that you can record video, that you can uh, 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 record yourself or screen and explain something there. So that trend is really much uh, uh, empowering the people to create things themselves, making from a, a viewer uh, a, a creator and making from a learner a teacher. Uh, that is what's happening and that is a trend from top down to bottom up. And you can actually bring all those trends together in what we call the learning diagram. And that learning diagram gives you sort of the overview of the whole world of learning. So on the top right, you have skills improvement, then you have formal learning on the top left. So top down formal learning is a description of the, the L&D driven uh, learning with formal courses to an LMS. Then you have knowledge transfer, uh, which is much more bottom up because people are sharing their knowledge very often in the form of a course or a training. So, for example, a lot of the content created in Easy Generator is like that. And you have performance support, also bottom up. So people are then sharing experience on how to do things, how to solve problems and how to, to uh, actually apply certain things. But that is also uh, information which is not meant for learning, but it's meant while you're working. So it's much more like support information. And those four categories are uh, basically describing the world of learning. And from an easy generator point of view, on the top of that diagram, you have like the instructor designers who are pretty much in charge, uh, creating content and pushing it down. And on the bottom side of things, you have the supplement experts, uh, where easy generator really focuses on uh, enabling them to capture their, their knowledge either in form of a learning or a performance support content. So this is where easy generator has a sweet spot, is the, the triangle. So the more you go on top, it's still also being used, by the way, quite a lot of, by instruction designers, but the real sweet spot of Easy Generator is facilitating people in the business, subject experts, to capture their knowledge in the form of a training or uh, a support material. And what we also see, there's a trend going from formal learning to knowledge transfer. It's a move that Easy Generator made itself, and now we're going more and more into performance support. So what we see is that tools are more and more facilitating the creation and, and, and the publication of content that is meant not to learn in, in a formal way, but to learn while you're working, so the performance. And with that, you get the impact of uh, uh, knowledge retention. So where Easy Generator, for example, started out to improve content creation, do it faster, uh, uh, to, to solve the problem that we have there with maintenance, also to create like a, a larger, uh, a, a group of people that can create content. That is where Easy Generator started. So we really improved content creation. But what we found is that with that, we are creating that corporate memory because all that information is stored into your corporate brain. And uh, so I see that my text shifted around a bit, but uh, here are the five groups of that, uh, 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 five uh, types of, of, of uh, 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 content that you can create. But what you are doing, in fact, the moment that employees started writing down their knowledge in the form of a training or another resource, you are starting to build up that corporate memory. And with that, you get a knowledge base that you can use that people can work with while they're working because that corporate memory will actually contain solutions for problems and, uh, and tells people how to apply certain things. So while you're working, you can dive into that corporate memory pull out that information and actually be more productive. So, and with that, you get what you was Platt said, uh, if HP knew what HP knows, you would be three times more productive. You actually start to realizing that dream. So the, the Swiss Easy Generator, by allowing people to create content in a very easy way, you build up that corporate knowledge, and then uh, you can actually improve your performance. So, um, that is it uh, from my side. If you have any questions, I'm uh, not sure if you have any questions, uh, type them in the chat, maybe you already did. So Molly is hopefully tracking that. Um, if you want to hear more about m generative Learning, we have uh, an ebook on that. Uh, Molly will share the link with you in the chat. And then uh, we're ready to take 
questions. Yeah, perfect. So we had uh, yeah two questions come up um, throughout your uh, presentation, Casper. So um, the first one is from Carla, who asked, uh, how would you describe the value of people working shorter periods of time for one organization? Wouldn't that be considered an advantage for that person, having a broad view of how different organizations work and being able to quickly adapt towards change? Yeah, that is true. So something that uh, that indeed um, people are getting more used to switching jobs uh, uh, and, and, and working themselves in a really, really fast pace. But then again, there, if you just see how much company specific information there is around in your organization, it's really huge. And if that isn't available for them to, to actually either find or be taught on, uh, it will be really hard for them to be onboarded in a good way. Then they have to do everything by, by uh, just trying uh, and failing and finding out how it works or maybe uh, uh, social learning. So it is really a big boost if you actually have that captured. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so another question. And before I ask this one again, uh, if you have any questions too, feel free to put them in the Q&A section. Um, and we'll be sure to answer as many as possible. Um, but yes, another one for you, Casper. So if employee-generated learning empowers employees uh, to create their own content, um, should instructional designers be worried about losing their jobs? <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I was looking at the, at the chat, so I sort of missed it. <laughs> no worries, yeah, I, can, I can ask it again. Uh, yeah. So if, if employee-generated learning empowers employees to create their own content, uh, should instructional designers be worried about losing their jobs? Uh, yes and no. Uh, so yeah, it is a change. Um, and for example, uh, companies like uh, uh, Danone, who are working with these generators, they are uh, calculating that probably 95% of all learning in the organization will be bottom-up created by employees and only 5% will be created top-down. And uh, that means there's way less content to create for instruction designers. And with that, uh, there is less need for instruction designers. At the same time, uh, there are all new roles opening up. So the whole process of guiding super experts in creating those courses. Um, we also see uh, an application of employee generated learning where people uh, from the LD department are taking charge. So instead of interviewing people, they still ask, they just ask people to create content. So, but they're pretty much in charge of that process. So it takes different shapes and forms. So it will definitely be a change. Uh, a change in the kind of work they do. If it will actually lead to less instruction designers, I think that's a bit soon to tell. So I assume that the, a lot of new work will arise. And what I see happening most of the time, even when we automate things and come up with new things, it tends we need more people and not less. So I think that we still need instruction designers, both for creation of courses and to guide and coach SMEs. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so maybe another question um, related to this one that we just got. So can an instructional designer become a curator? Oh, sorry, I was again looking at the chat. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you probably saw this one, but uh, can an instructional designer become a curator then in this case? Yeah, for a large part, but that is a trend that is also really uh, important uh, because uh, I, I didn't really mention it here. So it's a good addition, but curation. So instead of creating content, making sure that people have access to uh, uh, existing content is a really big part of that, that body of knowledge. So for example, if you would ask me uh, to write a, 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 a course or a book on e-learning, I can probably write a lot of pages full, but it will be a lot of information. And you could also ask me what are like the 10 most important books and just give me a brief explanation why those books are important, what I can get out of it. So then you become sort of like a sort of a, a personal third engine that filters out the information and that is really, really important. And that by itself is, is really used part of the whole uh, uh, knowledge retention. So uh, with this generator, we are uh, expanding our micro learning capabilities and uh, then in these also curation, so not the, the, the creating of, co of content, but the capturing of existing content and framing that in a certain way. And uh, that is a really big part of that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and another one, you mentioned microlearning, and this one kind of uh, mentions microlearning, but do you think that uh, with the changing employment scenarios, uh, new learning te technology should be introduced? Do we think, uh, or do we need to rethink microlearning to cope with the changing uh, learning needs? Yeah, um, good question. So the, the, the answer, in fact, is that we don't know yet. It also depends on how you define microlearning. 
So some people justify micro learning as smaller courses, but still like formal learning. In my mind, micro learning is something that you can use while you're working with that. The whole uh, dynamics of learning changes because that's so different than learning in a classroom. So I think the shift from formal to informal learning from uh, uh, basically classroom learning to workplace learning that is happening and with that everything changes so also indeed all the, the the audience how people learn what they want to learn when they want to learn but indeed also the tools and what you now see happening is that um, I think that the next thing in learning will not be like the evolution of a new tool we now have LMSs we have LXPs uh, we have knowledge bases so for the learner, the issue becomes, where can I find that information? And what you now see is that all those tools are sort of integrating with existing tools. So if you are working in Salesforce, you can actually look through Salesforce through all those databases and get that information. Or if you are in uh, uh, Teams or Slack, you can actually search directly through Teams and Slack for that information and get it there. So you will sort of come oblivion to where the content lives, but you uh, we are going to sort of use more and more existing channels to uh, uh, to benefit from that. Yeah, nice. And around that topic too, because a few people were asking for some more information, we have an ebook um, about microlearning on Easy Generator, which I put the um, link to in the chat as well. Um, so, um, yeah, feel free to download that as well. Um, yeah, and then uh, yeah. Someone asked, uh, Casper, I'm curious to hear how you are using Easy Generator. Um, maybe this is more around, um, yeah, how others are using Easy Generator, but any recent use cases you would like to share with us? Um, maybe we can discuss that, Casper, but also, yeah, in our later sessions, we'll go over that as well. But maybe you want to give a brief introduction for how most people are using Easy Generator. Yeah, that, that's maybe a webinar by itself. Um, yeah. <laughs> different so we see an application for example at electrolux we see people there trainers that apply the flipped classroom model so they capture a lot of the knowledge part of the of, of, uh, of their training in the course and ask people to take that up front and then uh, uh, during the classroom session which is now shorter they work on applying that by uh, doing role plays and stuff like that so uh, moving from face-to-face -face learning to a blended form is what we see a lot uh, as I said, there are organizations uh, implementing it really top down. So they use Easy Generator uh, and the subject experts as a replacement for creating the content by themselves, but they're still pretty much in charge of the process. Other organizations look at uh, a tool like Easy Generator much more like a way to share knowledge. So they allow anyone to create any content they want to create or share and, and leave that completely open. So there is a big mix of user stories there. And uh, we will, by the way, in, uh, uh, in the session with Young Case, uh, also uh, go into a bit more detail with a couple of examples there later today. Yeah, definitely. And even in the next one that we have coming up with uh, Herty Young, he'll be speaking about his personal experience with uh, Easy Generator as well. So <laughs> well-timed, I think. Um, and yeah, maybe just one final question, Casper, um, especially since this uh, event itself is focused a little bit on the future and preparing yourself for the future. Um, so Federico asks, is there a plan for the metaverse, uh, maybe when it comes to this <laughs> generator? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, uh, if, if, if Meta uh, has a plan for the metaverse yet. Uh, I'm not sure. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at that. I think it could be really, really interesting. Uh, but we had things like uh, uh, Second Life, where you could actually create a second sort of... Uh, uh, well, a virtual world where you can walk through and learn and, and work and play. And the idea of, of the whole metaverse is sort of the same. So I'm not sure what it will uh, will mean for learning. So I'm really following that, but I haven't, uh, yeah, I don't really understand yet what they are going to do. So it will be a big surprise, but uh, it will, if it is successful, it will influence uh, learning uh, definitely. So something that I, I really look forward to. Yeah, 